always pursuing us. God is always crying out to us, always speaking to us, right? All right, we're going to release the kiddos back to Children's Church. Pray they have a blessed time. But, you know, we were challenged with that question. You know, we, we know the, the psalm says that this is a day the Lord has made. You know, every day is a day that God made. He purposed, he intentionally created this day. And we were sort of challenged with what are we going to fill it with? What are we going to fill this day with? Because although there may be times when we don't feel like it, the truth is God's never far from any one of us. God is not far from us. As we pursue him, as we seek him, he'll be found by us. I mean, literally in James chapter 4, verse 8, just starting at the very first part here of the verse, we see this reality that as, as we come close to God, God comes close to us because he's never far. As we draw near to him, he draws near to us. When Paul was reaching out to the people in Athens and he was sharing the good news about Jesus with them, he gave this, this reality. He described it this way in Acts 17. He said, the God who made the world and everything in it, he's the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He, he's not like all the other gods of this world. In fact, it says in verse 25 that he's not even served by human hands as if though he needs anything. Rather, our God himself gives everyone life, gives everyone breath, gives everyone everything else that they need for life. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And God himself marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God himself decided all of those things ahead of time. It says in verse 27 that God had a purpose behind that. God did this so that they would seek him. So that they would perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. For in him alone we live, we move, we have our being. As some of their very own prophets, he was quoting their prophets in all of this. He said that we are his offspring. See, God's not far from any of us if we choose to seek him. If we choose to respond to him, if we choose to respond to him, God's desire is not to be far from us, but rather to live life together with us, in cooperation with us. He doesn't want us to be on our own, ever. He wants us to live and to work in cooperation, just as it was in the garden, in the beginning, before sin separated us. God walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, working together with them, giving them everything that they need in abundance. But often we, we really don't understand what it is to seek God. What we think is seeking God often really is not. And we just got to be honest with each other this morning. Because there's a, a, a drastic difference between seeking God and seeking the benefits of God. Although the two look very similar. They're as different as night is from day. Most of us have people in our lives that, um, that they only reach out to us when they need something, right? You know, you see, you see, the, you see the text come across or the call, and you know, you know before you even talk to them what they need. You know, they need some money, they need bailed out from a situation. You got some skill, some ability that they need, you know. It's the only reason they'll ever reach out to you. Um, you know, however... Those people, they, they really don't know us. They only know that thing about us, that we're able to do something or we're able to provide something, and that's all they really care about. They don't really take time to get to know us beyond that. They just know that they can reach out to us whenever they're in a bind. And if we took time to honestly analyze our relationship with God, how often are we that friend to him? We're not really seeking to know his mind, his heart, to really build a relationship and to get to know him. We just seek after him when we need something from him, right? And, and don't get me wrong, God wants to be our help in our time of need. He wants to be your provider of everything. 
His heart's desire is for all those things. He wants to meet every one of your needs. But he wants to be so much more. Like Abraham, he led him and he guided him, but he was called a friend of God. God actually wants to be your best friend, your BFF. You know, he, wants to, he wants to live life together with you. He wants you to get to know him beyond just what he's able to do for you. He wants to have a genuine, healthy relationship with you. And when we seek after God in that way, we're promised that we'll find him. So what we're considering this morning is what our response is to him. When we seek him, we find him. But then what do you do? It, it's kind of, it kind of, kind of the, the, the picture that came to mind when, whenever I was praying about this, you know, it's kind of like, you know, whenever you're maybe in your early teen years or even elementary or whatever, you know, you had a crush on somebody, you know, and you just, you just wanted so desperately, you know, to have a relationship with them, you know, and what if they said yes? Then what do you do? You know, like you, you, you kind of built your whole hope up in just that they would say yes. And then once they do, it's like, okay, now, now what? And Griffin's like, yeah, she said yes. That's... <laughs> now what do I do with this thing? I got a relationship now, you know? <laughs> but that's sort of what it's like, you know? God appointed to place us in this time of history within the bounds of this nation. And I am so thankful and blessed by it. However, his desire, his desire is that we would seek after him. That's why we are here for such a time as this. He wants us to seek after him. But how are we going to respond to him? Um, we, we find this account, and this is an example of this. In um, Luke chapter 17, Jesus was going through, and he was bringing people into an encounter with the kingdom of heaven. He was like, this is what the kingdom is like. And when he encountered these ten lepers, he healed them. He healed all ten of them. You know, and if, I think if you were here in the morning service, I think Jason Jablonski shared a little bit about what it was like to live life as a leper in that time. Just amazing life transformation took place. So he healed those ten. He told them to go show themselves to the priest, you know, which if you're ever healed of the Lord, don't be afraid to go to a doctor. They're going to confirm that you're healed. You don't have to be afraid that they're going to find something. They'll confirm that you're healed. Um, so he sent them off to the priest to confirm that healing. And an interesting thing happened. You know, they all had that encounter with God. They all received the same thing from the Lord. But only one came back, laid down their life before Jesus and said, thank you. And gave praise to God for the healing that he received. We have no idea what the other nine did. They probably got busy with their own lives and caught up and who knows what their end was. Crowds came for the benefits of God. They came pursuing Jesus because he would heal them. He would deliver them. He would restore them. He would forgive them, right? Crowds came to receive the ministry of Jesus in that way. They came to hear his teaching. But just a few laid down their lives to follow him. Only a few. Only a few. Revival is awesome. It's exciting to be a part of If you've ever tasted and seen a move of revival, you know, I know in modern day, if you've ever went to Toronto and that blessing is being poured out or down in Brownsville, you know, and ever all that was taking place, it's amazing. When true, genuine revival breaks out, when the Spirit of God moves, it is amazing to be a part of. Um, it's like when the, first, when the church first began at Pentecost, you know, people are getting saved, they're getting spirit-filled, they're getting healed, they're getting delivered um, they, you know they're, they're getting sent out in the mission field they're they're receiving spiritual gifts all this crazy stuff is happening and crowds come out to receive it and to be a part of it just to see what God's doing they come out for the benefits of God but why does God choose to move in such ways then if he knows that about people was it just to attract a large group of people? Was it just to give them signs that make people wonder? I've heard of all kinds of crazy things happening. We've seen a little bit of even here, you know, like, like gold dust. I've got, I've got videos of these microphones being covered in gold dust. It was insane. And the floor, and like, it, it was there. Like, it wasn't in my imagination. And it's not here now, but it's just like, it's like, God, why? Why would you do that, you know? It's amazing when God moves in that way. So what is the purpose of signs, wonders, and miracles. Why does God do that? Why does he move in that way? Well, if you want to get ahead of me and take a look at Matthew chapter 10 and 11, we're going to spend time there. 
we're going to see what the purpose was by Jesus' own um, account and his own testimony of what was happening when he was bringing revival, when revival was breaking out to God's own people, the Jews. In fact, this revival, this move of the Spirit was such a huge task that he didn't just do it himself. He equipped and he empowered teams of people to go out and to minister. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, it says that Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every sickness, to heal every disease. And then he goes through and he lists the name, names of the 12 apostles. And it says these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. This is all they needed. This was their seminary training. They had power, they had authority, and he told them this. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Their time hasn't come yet. It's now, but it wasn't at that time. He said, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. That was the message they were to preach. The kingdom of heaven is here. And he told them to do these things with the authority and the, the power that they were given. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. That's the synopsis of ministry. Everything you freely receive from God, you freely give away to other people. In fact, there's another account where he sent out and empowered 72 people to do the same. Today, he's equipped and empowered all of us to do that. To go out, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is here. He equips us to do all these things, to continue the ministry that Jesus had started. And then we see Jesus also went out and ministered in, in Matthew chapter 11. And it says that after Jesus finished and instructed the 12 disciples, he himself went out from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. He's going back home. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, you see, here's a purpose behind the signs, wonders, and miracles. It gets people talking, doesn't it? People start talking whenever things start happening like that. John and his disciples heard the deeds of the Messiah. And so he sent his disciples, John sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Are you for real, Jesus? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for? And Jesus replied to his disciples in this way. He's like, just go back and report to John everything you heard and saw. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. Don't stumble, don't get tripped up on things whenever the, the Spirit starts moving and God starts doing the miraculous. And it says as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. He asked them questions. He wanted to know what they thought about John. He said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Was it just a reed, a reed rather swayed by the wind? Well, if not, then what did you go out to see? Was it a man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. So then what did you go out to see? Was it a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He was the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. Who knows our God is a way maker where there is no other way. He will work a miracle on our behalf to release his kingdom here on the earth, bringing all of its provision, bringing our defense, bringing our answers, our solutions. He will do it. And Jesus goes on, he says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is still greater than he. So even if you're mopping floors in heaven, you're still greater than the greatest here on the earth. 
an awesome place to be, right? <laughs> and he goes on and he says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. And violent people have been raiding it. And if you don't know what he's talking about, just read the Old Testament about how God's people were treated. If you don't believe it, look at modern history of how the Jews are treated. Violence, day and night. They have missiles invading their country nonstop. And he goes on in verse 13. Jesus said, for all the prophets and the law have prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. You see, before the crowds were receiving ministry from Jesus, before they were going out in the wilderness to be water baptized by John, God sent prophet after prophet after prophet, declaring the ways of God, declaring the will of God, explaining the purposes of God, trying to lead God's people to himself. But they just weren't willing to listen. They had ears, but they wouldn't hear. They wanted to live life their own way, and things haven't really changed all that much, have they? God is still crying out to all of us, but so many of us just, we don't want to submit to God's ways. We just want to live life our own way, what we think is right. They wanted the blessing and provision of God, though, right? They wanted the blessing and the provision of God. They wanted all of God's benefits, but they didn't want to submit to his will or his ways. You know, we, we want to have our cake and eat it too, right? That's kind of the cliche saying out there, right? But it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Our creator knows why we were created. He knows the best way to live this life, regardless of what we may think. His ways are just better. And you can put his ways to the test. Try living life his way. Try living an honest life and see if the truth sets you free. Because you don't have to remember what lie you told this person, that person, that person. You don't have to keep it all straight. You don't have to worry about that person talking to that person. Just speak the truth and it sets you free. Work hard for a living and, and purchase your things instead of stealing them or trying to find some free way of getting about them, right? Just try God's ways. Try them out and see that they're better. His principles are true. They're the, the purpose for which we were created. See, God's people wanted his provision and his blessings, but they didn't want him telling them how to live their lives. But seeking God, it's not like a job search where you're just looking for the best option. It's not like insurance comparing, right? Where you're just trying to get the, the, the most you know, bang for your buck. It's, it's not like you know, checking out Progressive and Geico and figuring out who can uh, give you the best uh, options. It's not like clothes shopping where, you know, you, you try to go to Gabe's and get the, the brand names, you know, cheap. It's, it's not like that. The kingdom of God is a kingdom. What Jesus says goes. And it's up to us to either accept it or reject it. There, there's really no fence to sit on. It's all or nothing. It's a life commitment. It's a commitment. Now here these people were face to face with God in the flesh through Jesus. And they responded to him just as many in the generations before them responded to all the other prophets. I mean, they slaughtered him. They massacred him. They were tired of him telling them how to live their life. They wanted his benefits. They wanted healed and delivered. But when he said, you got to take up your cross to follow me, they bailed. When he was imprisoned and thrown on the cross, they were far from him. And Jesus was looking at them, and he just pondered this. And he said, to, to what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to everyone. We played the pipe for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, but you didn't mourn. How often do we do things for God? We say we're being obedient to him only with the motive of receiving something from him. We just want his blessing. We just want something from God. It's the only reason we're doing, you know, living, trying to live life his way. It's not because we actually love him and appreciate what he has done for us. It's just to get something from him. How often do we do things with the, the, the motive of just getting God's attention or invoking his generosity? 
Jesus compared it to essentially those who play music out on the streets wanting to get noticed or wanting to receive some money, all right? That's why they're playing. Um, they may love music, but that's not the motive for why they're playing out on the street corner, right? We were at Walmart in Indiana the other day, and there's this guy playing the violin. Man, it was just amazing, you know, just... But, you know, of course, he had his can in the front of him, you know. I mean, he, he was sharing his, his gift with people, but he wanted something in return. He, he wanted cash. He wanted money. How often is that our relationship with God? I'm going to obediently follow you. Just make something good out of this mess in my life. And then he does. And then once life's going good, you kind of forget about God's ways, right? And you just kind of live life on your own. So many people do it. We're all susceptible to it. It's all about why we do what we do. Why do we come to church every Sunday? Why do we serve him? Why do we help our neighbor in need? Why do we read his word? Why do we pray? Is it because we just want to get to know our Jesus better? Because we love him. We admire him. We, we, we want to be more like him. Or is it because we just want something from him? And it's okay if people misunderstand and misinterpret you and, and they malign your motives, right? People are going to do that. People are people. People can be nasty. They will misunderstand you. They will misinterpret you. They, they will falsely accuse you. But as long as you know what your heart motives are, that they are pure, that you're doing, just trying your best to do what God has called you to do, you're good. In fact, Jesus said, John came neither eating or drinking, but they said he has a demon, and here I am, Jesus said, the son of man, I came eating and drinking, and they say, I'm a glutton, I'm a drunk, I'm a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But you know what? Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Just let the fruit of your life shut up the mouths of the haters, right? Let the fruit of your life and why you're doing what you're doing just silence everyone who speaks against you. That's what Jesus did. He didn't even defend himself on the cross. He just let his life speak for itself. And then Jesus goes on here in verse 20. And he kind of goes on this rant. He said, Jesus began to denounce. Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed. Because they did not repent. He said, woe to you, Charzin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than it will be for you. And you, Capernaum, with you, will you be lifted to the height of the heavens? No. You're going to go down to hell, to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained till this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. You see, as Jesus went town to town, crowds of people came to him. To receive ministry from him. Jesus himself said that most of the miracles he performed were performed in these towns. Every sickness, every disease was healed. Every demon-possessed person was set free. Thousands and thousands of people came out to hear his preaching and to hear his teaching and to receive his ministry. And what would the church today call that? Tremendous ministry. Effective church. How are you doing what you're doing? Because I want to do that. I want to be like you. Man, you got thousands of people. You got multiple services. You know, God's just moving. The Spirit's moving. People are getting saved. They're getting uh, healed. They're getting delivered. You know, they're, they're receiving the benefits from God. But Jesus himself, when he experienced that same move in ministry, people were getting saved and delivered. Well, I, I keep saying that first part because <laughs> that's always my heart's focus. They were receiving the ministry of Jesus. They were getting healed. They were getting delivered. Right? They were hearing the preaching. They were, they were doing those things. But Jesus denounced it. Because his purpose and his intent behind his preaching, behind his healing, behind his delivering was to turn hearts back to his heavenly Father. To have heart transformation take place. 
His ministry wasn't to have sick people healed. It was to have hell-bound people redirected to heaven. It was to bring his kingdom and to invite them into it. It was to seek and to save the lost. It was for life transformation to take place. True and proper repentance. I was heading this way with my life, but then I encountered Jesus and he redirected me. True repentance is thinking differently about our lives. It is saying, not my will, not my way, but yours, Lord. My life is yours. I'm trusting you with it. Have your way. That's true, proper repentance. Jesus denounced it. In verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. They were healed, they were set free, but they weren't saved. They were like the nine lepers who were healed, but they didn't come back and lay their lives down before Jesus. Jesus brought revival to bring people into an encounter with the kingdom of God so that their hunger and thirst would be for more of it and less for the things of this world. It was to set their hearts back on eternity and away from the temporal. Revival is awesome absolutely awesome there is nothing like revival but if revival if revival means that all that happens is sick people get well demon oppressed and possessed people are set free and they continue to live their lives the way they want they're no better off in the end as they were in the beginning right If their bodies are healed just to continue walking straight for hell, what's the point of it? They'll have a better life here and now, but eternity is at stake. And I believe that that is why God is allowing a shaking to take place, even in our nation. An awakening to take place, that we're not playing games anymore. Life and death hang in the balance every day. Eternity is not as far away as we may think it. Our lives are very fragile. And we get so caught up on the temporary things. And that's what we consume our lives with. But God wants us to have hearts that are homesick. That long for eternal things. That we keep our eyes fixed, not on what's happening around us, but our eyes fixed on Him. He has a plan and a purpose through it all. That is what enables us to rise up in boldness and to gain victory over these temporary things here on the earth. We don't want to see just people get, that get healed in vain. We want them to get healed and that that leads them to Jesus and they surrender their lives to him. If they are given spot on, accurate words of knowledge, amazing prophetic words, if they are slain in the spirit and they lay here for hours and hours and hours on end having an amazing encounter with Jesus and they get up off that floor and they walk out of these doors and they just go about the lives like they always had, we've missed the point. There needs to be a surrendering to Jesus. He surrendered everything. I mean, he's not asking us to give up anything. He didn't surrender. He lived life in this flesh. He knows what we deal with. He was tempted and tried in every way that we are, yet he gained victory in everything. Then he freely offers it to us. He wants us to reign victorious in life as well. Not to be victims pushed around and shoved around and bullied by life, but victors who take life by the horns. In fact, his word literally says he wants us to be the head and not the tail. He doesn't want you just to be thrashed all around, you know, by life. He wants you to to intentionally live life. He wants you to purposefully live life. In fact, he said to do so is to live life abundantly to its fullest. God wants to see real, genuine life transformation taking place that's what revival is all about that's what signs wonders and miracles are all about they are literally signs to point people to jesus that he's not some made-up entity like all the other gods of all the other religions he's real he's alive and i'll tell you what nothing says i love you more than a sickness being healed more than some oppression that you just can't get free from some addiction that has just consumed your life being set free 
There is no greater expression of love than what Jesus has done for us, to lay down his life for us. And what Jesus proved on the cross is that when we choose to lay down our life for the Father, he will lift it up. He will give it purpose. He will give it um, abundance. He will pour out such blessing into it that you'll never count the cost of what you gave up. Because his life is just so rich, so full, so abundant that it doesn't matter what we gave up here in this lifetime. Jesus ends his lament with this beckoning. That is his beckoning to us this morning. Jesus, he lamented and he denounced all of those towns. And he ends that, that, that rant with, come to me, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened. You see, he didn't despise the crowds of people that came to him for ministry. He wanted to minister to them. But he wanted to give them so much more than just their healing and deliverance. He wanted to give them the fullness of life. But he can only do that if they lay it down. It's what water baptism is all about, laying down your old self so that God can raise you up into new life. And man, it's hard to lay that old life down, isn't it? I struggle with it every day. I'm preaching to the choir. I live in the same flesh as you do. There are some old habits that are hard to kick. There are some old ways of thinking that I just can't seem to get free from. You know, that, that, that dead person just doesn't want to stay dead. But that's what it's all about. So Jesus is calling. He's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. He said, he gave a promise, I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Whew. That's that kind of vacation we talked about last week. You can take a vacation from your work and from your daily life, but there is nothing that compares to the rest that you can find in your soul. That you can be at peace and at rest no matter what stress is happening around you in life, no matter how hectic your schedule gets. Jesus wants to give a rest for your soul. That your mind, your will, your emotions are steadfast are confident, are at peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. That's the kind of peace that he wants to give you, a peace in your soul. And Jesus goes on in verse 30, he said, For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so when revival comes to this place, and I believe it's stirring and it's coming, there's so many prophetic words about it, May we always remain centered and keep that, that priority in mind. That whatever else the Spirit of God does through our lives, wherever we're at, whatever is happening. Because revival ain't about poor church buildings. Most of the revival that happened, happened out in the marketplace, out on the streets, out in the communities, out with their neighbors, right? That's, read the New Testament, that's where it was taking place. This is a training and equipping and empowering place where, as Becky had shared many times, we come together, we're stronger, right? I need my fellow warriors to get through this life. I need your shield and your armor because mine grows weak in some areas sometimes, right? We need each other. But we come in here to get strengthened and equipped and empowered to go out and to take the kingdom so that we can declare to people the kingdom is here. The kingdom's right here. Don't miss out on it. Don't miss out on anything God has for you. And as the Spirit is moving, may we never forget that the most important miracle that could ever take place is a life that surrenders itself to Jesus. Salvation. The lost getting found. People getting saved. It's the greatest miracle of all. When, when Jesus puts to death the flesh and raises us up again in a new life in the Spirit. When he fills us with his Holy Spirit, there is no greater miracle than that. That's the number one miracle, a lost soul saved. 
All that truly matters is that people choose to yoke themselves to Jesus in this life. To cast off all the depression and oppression and worry and anxiety. Jesus said in, in the book of James to cast it all on him. Yoke yourself to him because he cares for you. Literally a yoke of oxen. He puts his arm around you and he takes that weight up off of you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He gives you peace. He gives you comfort. He puts his arm around you and he helps take those burdens of life. Because he knows they're too much for you to bear. You're going to break on your own. You need him. You need him. But if that doesn't take place, all the signs, wonders, and miracles are done in vain. If people's eternity remains unchanged. Explained it in Corinthians. You can speak in tongues all you want, but it's a bunch of clanging symbols. If people don't encounter the love of God, the love of God, the unfailing, life transforming love of God, the far surpasses every other miracle that we could ever experience. And so let's just close here in prayer. Jesus, forgive us for getting so busy with so many things. Forgive us for leaning on our own understanding, trying to figure out life on our own, trying to do it our own way and our own strength. Jesus, this morning I surrender my life to you. You know how tired and worn out I am of fighting and never feeling like I'm getting ahead. Working so hard, but it seems like all the provision on this earth is not enough. That sounds so good, Jesus. A light and easy yoke. Comfort and peace for my soul. Jesus, take me as I am and have your way. I trust you with my life right now. I choose to put my arm around you and allow you to carry me from this point forward. You guide me, you lead me, you direct me. Lord, I'll trust on you and not my own understanding. I'll lean on you and follow you wherever you take me. Whatever the cost is, Jesus, I won't even count it because of the splendor and the richness of your kingdom. Help me to keep my eyes fixed on you and not to drown in the things of this world that overwhelm me. My life is yours, Jesus. Your will, your way, always in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So my prayers, you leave this place blessed. Breathe in a sigh of relief. That his comfort just overwhelms you like that tidal wave, like that hurricane. Just washes all those worries away. You're a new person in him. Amen. Amen. Enjoy it. Enjoy this life he's given you.